now Richard is here. All right, now let me uh, unmute here. Also, my camera messed up as soon as I did that, but I'll fix it. That's the virtual cam doing that, but this usually fixes it. There we go. Richard's on the big panel here. I think you can see that. Let me try to fix it. Now, can you hear me, Richard? Oh, wait, hold on. Wait, wait. I can't hear you, though. Okay, let's see. Also, I can hear you, and I also hear the delightful sounds of R&B in the background. Really? I can't hear that. Big tech cult boy oh, said right. $3, Ralph. Well, you don't say based enough on stream or have enough irony in your voice. What's up with that? Me and my Grow Iper army don't think it's very cool, dude. I'm bald, and my Grow Iper friends always have my back. All right, now, thank you. Uh, uh, why is my camera doing this? Hold up. I may have to... I don't know. We'll see if it keeps doing that. I may have to. Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing something in the way you make me feel in the background. Am I? No, just wait. That's literally you, dude. going insane. No, dude, or? That's, not, that's yours, man. There's no. Oh my so, god. <laughs> that's not happening here. All right. I'm <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, I got it. Okay, it was. Oh my god, it was on a. Uh, <laughs> that's actually pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, it was on a, a window that I had open. That's I was funny. like, what? Uh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> think that's out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard Spencer's here. Now we're going to uh, pause the TTS. Like I said, now we'll unpause it in like 15, 20 minutes and get some of the questions in just so we could get a, you know, a little respite and people can talk uh, in, yeah. full, in full thoughts. We will get them in, so stack them up if you want, but I just want to put that out at the beginning. If you're like, hey, I don't hear it immediately, that's why. Uh, now, Richard's here. Uh, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine? Uh, well, I, I've uh, I've actually been on a big hiking trip the last 10 days. Did really? something happen? Yeah. <laughs> well, where'd you hike, first off? <laughs> no, I was, I was oh, joking. I thought you actually were. Um, I do go on hiking trips, not not of the ten day variety, but um, the Appalachian Trail. I remember when uh, the governor of South Carolina did that. I was living in South Carolina at the time, by the way. I that was so. almost tragic and romantic. He was it off was. with his mistress, or yeah, something. His South American. He just abandoned mistress. his post as governor, and to, yes, he just went he to looked, go find himself. He yeah. literally did. Yeah, yeah. All right, now um, there's a war in Ukraine, obviously, but uh, yeah. You know. Well. Um, I'll give you, I guess, the the lowdown. I mean, I, I I would say this. I mean, what we have seen isn't just a Russian attack on Ukraine. Uh, I think we've witnessed a massive paradigm shift, a global reset. I, I actually think that's a very good way of describing it. I know that was a kind of term that was thrown around the right wing. I don't think this is the reset they had in mind. But it is a reset to the 20th century in many ways, and we have, with some important differences, but we have re-entered that type of landscape in which nuclear war is now an option, uh, in which the concept of the West, as opposed to a unipolar global system or something like that, is now something that is on everyone's lips. You see it in every headline. Uh, so I don't think this can be underestimated. Uh, what has just happened. I mean, we have entered a new, absolutely new paradigm. And when you get new information, you sometimes change your opinion. And when the world changes as dramatically as it has, you also have to allow your, your thinking and your, your actions and your, your basic conception of like us and them change as well. Um, I, I don't think this can be underestimated, what what has happened. Now, wh wh what do you think of Putin's decision to go into the, not the Ukraine, excuse me, Ukraine. Ukraine. <laughs> They'll get on to me if I, I fall into that. Uh, I haven't done it this whole time, which is fucking hilarious. I almost did it there. All right. What do you think about it? Well, I understand his reasoning, and I don't think Putin is a madman. And I think he is actually acting in a understandable or fairly rational way. Uh, he views, he has a concept of empire, which is very different than Washington DC's concept of like, you know, 
economic globalism and the American empire and all that kind of stuff. He has a concept of a Russian zone and he has a, also a concept of Ukraine, which has a lot of historical resonance to it, which is that it is just absolutely part of Russia and that the Russian empire has a, a almost kind of like a dual capital in Kiev and Moscow. Um, there, there, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, NATO aggression and, 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 all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, NATO was founded in the late 40s. It, it was actually created during the German crisis, the Berlin crisis. Uh, it is absolutely a military alliance directed against a Soviet or you could say Russian empire, because in many ways, the Soviet Union inherited the structure of the Russian empire. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can NATO be, you know, over aggressive? Was there could have there been a way that we could have solved this problem, like some kind of neutralization of Ukraine? Maybe. But the fact is, that is what NATO does. NATO is NATOing. It is an anti-Russian alliance. That's what it is. So this idea that NATO is, you know, uh, out of control or that NATO expansion is threatening Russia. Well, it, it just seems to be utterly beside the point. It's like criticizing a, a, a quarterback for throwing the football down the field. It, it's that's what he does. And um, I agree that NATO went through a kind of identity crisis over the last 30 years what is this? What do we do with this thing? It's like a Ferrari in your garage. It was a, it was a cold war relic. Apparently, what do we do with this thing? Should we just, should we get rid of it? Should we scrap it for parts? Should we, you know, go on humanitarian interventions? We don't know. Well, now it's original raison d'etre has returned. There is a similar identity crisis with Russia. Who, who are we? Are, are we, should we join NATO? That was actually thrown out. Uh, th uh, thrown out in the sense of offered up at some point. I would absolutely have supported that if I were in government um, in the late 90s and 2000s. But, you know, who are we as Russians? What, what does this empire mean? Well, Putin has made things that are unclear clear. He has reestablished what he is about. And we have reentered the 20th century. It, it is just a totally new paradigm. So, yes, NATO like there could have been a lot of things that could have been done, but I'm not even sure that even if like, you know, John Mearsheimer or me or something like that was secretary of state <laughs> with John, at least there's a 1% chance that could happen with me. There's less than that. But even if we were secretary of state and we made some, you know, diplomatic real politic offer of like, well, let's allow Ukraine to go into the EU, but then we'll also sign a treaty that says for the next hundred years, it will never enter NATO. So it's kind of a compromise. I, I don't think he would, Putin would have accepted such a thing. I don't think Putin will accept anything outside of the reestablishment of his zone, the Russian zone and retaking the Russian lands. And it is what it is. I, in a way, respect it. I don't think he is a lunatic. Um, I, I think it's people are on edge and, and panicked because we've re-entered a 20th century kind of, in a way, stability. Um, but a stability in which nuclear war is uh, now an option. Um, so, I mean, that that's how I view it. And um, that's where we are. And, I mean, I guess you wanted me to come on here to call people out as traitors. Well, that's what <laughs> you said. Like, now, wait, hold on. First off, I do have the willing to do that. I do have but. the TTS clock on the screen, by the way. Uh, so we'll. I, I'm going to try this. And we'll see how that works. Um, now, yeah. Well, I mean, you did say the traitor. I think the traitor caucus or, or something like that on Twitter. Yeah, the I mean, traitors coalition. Yeah, yeah, the traitors coalition. Now, so I didn't. I did kind of hype up that that verbiage, but I mean, you did use that verbiage. So yeah. Uh, now. What makes you say that? Now, you came on. That was a very level-headed analysis, I thought, uh, and uh, very laid back, and you, it wasn't really yeah. fire-breathing, but uh, that well, kind of was on Twitter. I, I think that, you know, the Russian advance creeps along, and it, I mean, I, I had... I had forgotten this, but I mean, it took a month for the U S to, to reach Baghdad. And that was in a totally different situation. 
Um, so it might yeah. take three months or so for Putin to reach Kiev or something. I mean, I think it's reasonable to say that he's going to win. Yeah. Um, now, what he does after that, because, you know, the a national spirit among Ukrainians, however ambivalent they might have been, they're not ambivalent now, at, at least once you get like a little bit westerly. Um, there, there are, you know, the Donbass region, I'm sure you can absolutely find people support this and say they're Russian, but other than that, you won't. And so I, I don't, I, I, I think the whole situation just seems totally unworkable for Putin. And if maybe if this had been done in 2004, that would have been a different story. Uh, but, um, I, I see a divided Ukraine. I see a German solution. That is my prediction that I'll, I'll throw out there for people. Um, I, I see a German solution, a divided Ukraine. And I think at least half of it will be member, a full member of NATO within the next say three to five years. And the other half will be part of the Russian zone. And it's going to be a really painful divided place. But in terms of the trader stuff, what I've, noticed is that there is this huge crossover between people who were really into support the steel, uh, stop the steel. COVID is a lie. I hate everything. Um, uh, what, what's, what's the next, co- you know, conspiracy theory that they're into. It's just a kind of like coalition of malcontents. Now I understand to a very large degree why they think that, but they are basically just kind of like looking at their screen and they think that like Putin has invaded Jen Psaki's miniskirt. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad. Um, <laughs> they think that like, this is some campaign against wokeness or feminism or that the U S has been humiliated or NATO has been humiliated and, Oh, the global economy is going down and, you know, blah, 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 you know, J six has been redeemed. Putin's the good guy. They, they, they have such resentment, much of it totally well-founded, but it's such an overwhelming resentment. You see this, the dirt bag left a lot of the dissident, right? Most of the dissident, right? I would say that you just start to root on another country that is literally threatening you with nuclear war and is not actually going to solve any, a single problem for you in your country. And in fact, wishes the worst upon you. Now, but wait, hold on. Now, are they threatening us that with nuclear like war? a traitor's coalition. Well, now, hold on. Uh, we're not involved in direct warfare with Russia. Uh, I don't think to... <laughs> we are, though. Well, okay. Well, not. I mean, what? Giving weapons to another country? We are. We aren't. We're involved with war. We're not. Like, I mean, I don't know. We're not declared war against... We have not done that. Uh, no, and, of course not. There's no no-fly zone. Well, and until, and we, until we do that... providing aid and... Okay. Like, those threats are We provided aid to a lot of different... Us scenarios and, and terrorists and countries and we've killed dictators and overthrown governments. Uh, we don't have to support every foreign policy decision of our government makes. Uh, and right up until we are actually at war, I, I would say it's, uh, it's fun to, to go out and say whatever you want uh, about, uh, about our foreign policy decisions. Right. I mean, I don't I, think that, I, that makes, I it- have my own criticisms, but like, now, if we were at war with Russia, are, right okay, now. I mean, this you would be not, right. Th- we, we haven't chosen to go to war in Iraq or, or something like that. And the people on the other side are not like, I, I, I mean, I. Well, they call people traitors who were against the Iraq war uh, in, in 2003. Yeah. Uh, plenty of people were called that. Uh, and it was ridiculous then, honestly. But it, that was a war scenario. Um, you know, and people were speaking out saying this was bullshit and we should pull back. And this is much more dramatic and paradigm shifting than the Iraq war. Well, I agree. It's it's a much more dangerous. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, look, I've been saying this on the show, uh, the the last week. I mean, this is way more serious than Iraq. I mean, that's like playing around the sandbox, uh, versus what can happen with this scenario. I mean, that's not even, uh, but I mean, we set a lot of these, a lot of precedent with our actions, uh, in Iraq. And when we see Connolly, of rice uh, and these usual suspects on TV talking about sovereignty, etc. I mean, it's a fucking joke. Uh, and you you say, why would anybody? I mean, I don't know if you said this exactly. It's because but- it's Europeans, it's white people. I mean, some of these journalists said this out loud last weekend, and they were corrected. And I doubt they'll say it again. But the the reason is is because it is viewed as a European country. So it even 
evokes the Second World War, and it just matters more. I mean, I agree with the hypocrisy. I mean, Joe Biden now is like calling and not getting through to the Saudis, and they're mad that he's not like fully behind their horrifying genocidal, well, not 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 exactly genocidal, but horrifying campaign in Yemen. And yeah. it, it's just, you know, like it, it's, I know it's horrible to say, but on some, at some level, those people don't matter as much. And this is real. Th- this is, this could affect central Europe almost immediately. I mean, this, this could affect um, Western Europe. This, this brings us back to campaigns that were really about the soul of the world and, and the second world war and the cold war. So it just matters more. And, you know, for whatever you want to say, people look at Iraq and it's like, well, I mean, I absolutely oppose the Iraq war. It's what got me into well, yeah. dissident politics, but it's like at the end of the day, it doesn't fundamentally change things. And when you're battling over heartland Europe, it does. Well, and but look, what I'm saying is you just laid it out at the start of the show. What Putin's doing is not irrational. This is not some no. wild thing. He's been pushed into this in a lot of ways. Uh, now, did he have to make the call in the end? No, he didn't. I mean, that was a bold move uh, that I don't know too many others who probably would have done that in the current uh, modern landscape. But uh, <laughs> you, you talk about NATO is an is inherently anti-Russian organization on his doorstep pushing his expansion. Um, they keep making hostile moves towards Russia instead of any, uh, basically, you know, treating them like an enemy uh, this whole time. And, you know, Russia's Russia, like you said. They don't always have our best interests at heart, uh, to, to put it mildly. That's true, but um, there's no reason they should, uh, right? Like, I, I, don't, um, I don't see it as some traitor's declar- declaration to um, be, if not pro-Putin, somewhat you know, uh, a little bit rooting for Russia in this because the media is kind of, I mean, and you can put it how you want, but uh, there's been story after story where, um, you know, the ghost of Kiev and all this bullshit and just flat out lies and Zelensky being pushed down your throat and all that. You would think we were at war with Ukraine, to be honest with you. You're right. Uh, Driving up to D.C., the Kennedy Center. I was there this past weekend. It's lit up in the Ukrainian colors coming up from Florida the week before. There's billboard after billboard board of Ukraine strong and all this stuff it's being shoved down your throat I guess is what I'm saying you see the same people from the Iraq war era on TV saying the same bullshit uh, and it's just not a good feel uh, I guess is what I'm saying and uh, I, I, I think this is all a good thing and I I, I feel like the right simply re, the right and in a, a huge segment of not maybe not huge, very significant segment of the left wants to oppose this just because they want to oppose everything and they want to project fantasies upon Russia or, uh, you know, uh, or, or even uh, certainly other people project fantasies on Ukraine, but they want to project fantasies on, on Russia that aren't there. Um, once you have an enemy abroad, that is going to make the world more conservative death is in the air you've got to face off against an adversary the the intensity of that makes you rethink matters we're going to have to rethink energy germany is going to force to rethink energy and all this green stuff which was supported by uh to a large extent russians by the way uh is going to be thrown out the window in favor of nuclear power and so on so like it, intensity and danger are good and they bring about like a greater kind of right wing quality uh, well, a in lot people of- as, as the cold war did and what you guys are, are not you guys necessarily, but like That's what fun. libertarians online are, they're almost like lamenting the end of globalism or something like that. You know, it's like, Oh, you know, why did NATO have to do this? 
you know, uh, that's just that's just totally like denying any agency to Putin as if he didn't want this all along. He made hasn't the, yeah. wanted this for a long time. And I it's like, why did said. NATO force this upon us? Like, you know, we should just be, it, it's just like this desire for the for, for the end of history. But they also gave him the excuse, I guess, is what I'm saying. It's clear. Uh, and if you read anything about Putin before this, you would already know that this has been his stated position, especially in private. He's talked about this kind of thing all the time. Uh, and I've read story after story literally for years uh, about his thought process on this and his speech where he came out, basically declared war uh, on Ukraine at two hour speech or no, it was the one right before, I guess they went to war, that long speech. Mm -hmm. uh, and he just laid out his whole philosophy and it's going back. It's a history lesson. Professor Putin, Professor yes. Putin style. Basically, I loved it. Uh, you don't see anything <laughs> like that ever from a U.S. president uh, like the guy was speaking and and big terms you know what i mean and historical concepts and mm -hmm. what did the czar do and lenin did this uh anyway um so you you see that but okay that's true he made the call but we kind of played into that being his you know what i mean like him being able to say okay it's a responsible call right or it's a it's a fair call by us always kind of um uh, never relenting in the anti-russianness i guess yeah, I mean, there, there, there's been a kind of mini Cold War for a long time. And you can see this with things like Edward Snowden. You could see this with the Pussy Riot. I mean, this is going back to like 2012. Well, there's like an establishment built up ago. even from the Cold War, right? Where there's still this, there's still this anti-Russian apparatus that never went away ever. Right. And there's a, there's a, a residual anti-Russian feeling in the American public as well. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Yes. And so it, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I lament much of that. If I could have my way, um, I would want a NATO alliance that, that's kind of reimagined and, and basically includes the, it's a Northern Hemisphere alliance. It would include Russia and Russia would be providing gas to Germany. Like that's a good use of that, um, all of that massive land. But the thing is, what I want and what Putin wants, Putin does not see the world like that. When Putin was actually in a dialogue with Michael McFall, he pointed to his skin and he goes, you, this is so deceptive. You think I'm white like you. I'm not white. We don't think like, he is not, he does not have the vision that someone like myself does. He has a vision of a Russian sphere that much as the Soviet Union almost needed to define itself against uh, capitalism and the decadent West or whatever, almost needs to define itself against the West. It has its own identity issues and they do not want what is best for us. I was mistaken about that for a long time because I, in a way, bought into the the hype and and what was ultimately propaganda uh they they want the russians view define themselves by by like let's spread chaos in the west like we want to we want to promote the worst possible thing in the west to take shape that is what they want for us and absolutely as one television commentator said i mean what's the what's the use of the world if russia can't be in it the idea that they would, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying they want this, but the idea that they are totally fearful or it's off the table that they won't engage in some kind of nuclear exchange is just wrong. They are willing to do that. And that means that we need to return to the kind of national security apparatus that we had previously. And we need to kind of examine ourselves and begin understanding ourselves as Westerners vis-a-vis -vis this threat. And as you can tell, like, I just love this at the end of the day, like this is mo more and it's, it's filled me with more enthusiasm. The Europe is uniting. I mean, the Europeans want well, a to big be European armed. War. Europe is excited about Germany rearming. I mean, that, that was impossible two weeks ago. Now it's happening. I mean, it, it's just the greatest thing. I mean, people are arming across the continent. European unity and <laughs> unification is occurring because of this. I mean, all right, yeah. we're gonna take college. By the way, I love uh, it. Let me let me take some of these super chests too. Let me the timer's up. We'll do another timer after we go through these. Uh, let's see, where are we at here? Uh, okay, hold on. Where is this? Oh boy. Okay. 
Let's see. Big T. Some, sometimes they come in out of order. I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss any. Let me let me refresh that and go back. Uh, okay. Cisco, we got that on Big T. Okay. Big T sent $3 such aggressive shilling. His rabbi handler must be right off camera, maybe even holding the K cards now, this, in the mouth. <laughs> this is from earlier before Richard even came on. I think that's from Pence. <laughs> oh, that's from Pence. Yeah. Okay. As I say, that wasn't even, that was at 950. I was like, he wasn't even here uh, at that point. Okay. Did that one play earlier? Because I didn't. I think it did. Oh, okay. I didn't hear that one. Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, this one didn't. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Spicy sent $3. What would Dugan do? Did you study that shit as much as your All ex-wife? Right. Tell me what you think about Duganist and shit. Now, the the Duganist part is fair, but anyway, what, what do you want to ask me? Well, I mean, Dugan remains a, a, a fascinating intellectual and man, and, um, you know, on, on, on that level, I, I certainly have respect for him, but um, he is absolutely a, a, a kind of extreme expression of, of what I'm talking about in terms of defining a Russianness against the West and seeking greater chaos and, and destruction in the West. Um, now, Dugan is not a Rasputin to Putin or something like that. I, I, I think he's as much a Rasputin to Putin as I am a Rasputin to Trump in the sense, you know, <laughs> very, very little. Uh, but I, I think he is, he's, he, he represents a kind of bombastic extreme version of what I'm talking about. Um, Dugan doesn't seek the betterment of the white race or something like this. Dugan is, I mean, he began obviously as a Russian Bolshevik, um, he is a kind of Nazbol, the original Nazbol. Uh, he has a Eurasian vision. Um, it is the, the West is a foil to this. Uh, the West is what needs to be avoided. The West is evil almost in this conception. Uh, I mean, I, I respect Dugan, but you have to see him for who he is. All right. Uh, by the way, Cisco, I'll let you get in, get in here in a minute too if you want to ask some questions. Uh, now let me um, also see here. Uh, okay, I hit the wrong button. All right, damn Bigfoot, go. Damn Bigfoot sent three dollars. How do the pro Russia people cope with the ten thousand Chechens Islamists screaming Allah Akbar while marching to kill white Ukrainians to denazify a country with a Jewish leader? You know, there, there is some interesting uh, dynamics at play here. The Nazi Azov Battalion or, or, or whatever. There's definitely Nazis in Ukraine, too. Um, yeah, I mean, look, they're, 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 they're Nazis. They're skinheads everywhere, okay? And, uh, you well, know, the Azov no Battalion are very serious people. Now, yeah. the Azov Battalion, I, I would not, I will never deny um, the humanitarian crisis in Donbass. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many people have died. There's been estimates of, I've heard 15,000. I've heard higher than that. I, I don't have an opinion on that other than it's a crisis and I wish it would not happen. Um, but I mean, think about the, and I also understand people in that region who are just totally understand themselves as Russians. I mean, I get it. Um, but I mean, the Maidan, I, I think there's the, been this tendency, and I fell into this tendency as much as anyone um, previous to my kind of rethinking. But um, there's this tendency of just seeing Maidan as this just CIA op. The fact is, there was a lot of organic, um, sp uh, emotional, spontaneous coming together involved in Maidan. And it was about Ukraine is Europe in the sense that they did not, they view rightly or wrongly Russian rule as Soviet rule. And I kind of understand why they would think that in the sense that Russian rule means extreme wealth inequality and extreme um, uh, centralization of all domestic product in the hands of these oligarch types. Now, whether Ukraine's a lot better, you know, fair enough, but 
there, there was a call to become part of Europe and a call for something different in my time, in my dawn. And even as of, I mean, I've been looking into them a, a little bit more recently. Um, they wanted a kind of my dawn in Russia in the sense that they want to see Russians as achieving this kind of new world, this kind of European spirit along with them. So, you know, I, I'm not going to give a full endorsement of Azov. They, they are what they are. They're obviously fierce, passionate fighters. There's some really big problems. I absolutely condemn any kind of, you know, these vicious attacks that they engaged in um, against uh, Russians, the burning down of buildings, people inside of it, horrible stuff. But, you know, you, you, you have to kind of like see where the movement is. And what does it mean when Ukrainians want to be a nation state? That means that they want to be a part of the greater white race. And they don't want a Soviet atmosphere. They, they want what is a, a recognizable, you know, white country. And to be part of the West. And that means kind of being part of us. And that's something that we can participate in as well. I think there are a lot of very good things about uh, what we're seeing on, on the Western side. And if a bunch of Redditors and mainstream media people and Jen Psaki and whatever support it, all the better. We don't need to make decisions based on, you know, uh, NBC likes this, therefore I hate it. You know, NBC probably likes eating steak and drinking bourbon. That doesn't mean that those things are bad. <laughs> Now wait a minute. Was that? Does I feel like that was a personal? All right. Now let me. Um... <laughs> All right. Let me play this. Kiosquin sent three dollars. Richard, now that you're on the World Economic Forum's payroll, can you tell us whether or not its health and dental plan is better than the FBI's plan? Oh. Have you sat on Klaus Schwab's lap yet? All right. Now that would be. All right, now, Klaus Schwab, what do you know about Schwab? Well, I'll ask him. He's just in the other <laughs> room. Yeah. All right, now, some of these, are, you know how they go. Some of them are insulting or whatever. Godzilla37 sent $3, Richard. Serious question. There's no way you're not gay. Okay. Yeah. Dylan sent $3, no matter your opinion or where you fall on the DR. Can we all agree Richard Spencer just sounds epic every time he talks? Even if he was reading the phone book. Nice one. Right, Godzilla. Godzilla37 sent $3, I know. I know wasn't a question. Now answer it. All right, now. Go ahead, Dylan. Dylan Folk sent $3. Richard, did you see the comment on the Angel Dust YouTube channel yesterday? I wake up, listen to Richard, go to sleep. More audio of Richard is uploaded. This is my life now. Lamau. Did you write that, Dylan? What? The God don't... He said, did you see there was a comment, I guess, on the Angel Dust YouTube channel. I wake up, listen to Richard, go to sleep. More audio of Richard is uploaded. This is my life now. Um, oh, I see. Some, so someone's really listening. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Someone really heard Good. That. All right, let's see. Oh, no, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Right, I'll, I'll read that one. I'll read that one. Uh, hey, Dick, he said, how about that um, certain heritage, certain persuasion, quote, unquote, Ukrainian president? Um, um, well, look, guys, there there are Jews everywhere. Like, if, if, if you know, Putin has a very good relationship with um, Jews. Israel has mostly been neutral. I, I don't know if Israel has actually sounded off on this crisis. They seem to be taking the kind of China policy where they don't want to sound massively hypocritical. And so they don't really um, condemn anyone invading in a, a neighboring country. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's just, it's, it's like, if you, if, if you want to go find if, if, if you want to go find, like, there's some Jew behind something. I mean, there is apparently a Jewish backing of Azov Battalion. Um, there's yeah, Jewish we've heard backing, about that, actually, yeah. 
of the Wagner group, which is or the Wagner group, which is trying to assassinate Zelensky. There's I mean, it, 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 you can find now. Some, what about this? Now I have to. What about? Let me ask you about this though. There is theories that there's Jewish backing on both sides, basically. Uh, and this has been laid out to me several times by viewers of the show, certain segment at least. Uh, a lot of people are pro Putin, obviously, and they're cheering or whatever. Uh, but there are some people who say this is uh, basically. Jewish power, Jewish influence is kind of directing this on both sides uh, and that they're, they're winning. Well, there, there's Jewish involvement on both sides, but you, you can basically say that about everything. I mean, there, there's Jewish involvement in Hollywood. There's also Jewish involvement in like Christian, the Christian movie industry. There's Jewish involvement in pornography. There's Jewish involvement in gospel music. I mean, it's just like you can just... Right. You enter a labyrinth of Jews are smart and wealthy and they get involved in stuff. But um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think this is some like trick to slaughter a bunch of white people. I mean, as I said at the beginning, um, I, I think there are Russia has real interests. Those interests are not mine. Those interests are not ours. We live in a very different situation. No. I was just going to say, but, somebody in chat said there were good people on both sides. <laughs> there were good Jews on both sides. I mean, you, yeah, you can say that about almost everything, basically. Holy shit. All right, let me get these in. Then be ready, Cisco. I'm coming to you next. Now, where is the... Uh, okay, here we go. Then we'll do the timer again, and we'll take some calls, too. Oh, my God. A non-underscore boy sent $3 part of the West is literally no. homosexuality, transgenderism, and non-white mass immigration. Now, what about that? Well, yeah, yes, we have gone mad. There is no question. And there are actually some really deep reasons for that. And there are some kind of shallow reasons for that. There are some reasons for that of like, we've gone crazy due to social media and so on. But there are, of course, some deeper egalitarian and nihilistic principles at the heart of how we understand the West. But just to sum up who we are as we promote transsexual transsexuality in kindergarten. It's just, it, it is in itself nihilistic. I mean, is it like, that's who we are. That's all we are. And I will also just say you, people don't have to buy in to my hot take theory that the world is going to become more conservative due to this, particularly America and the West, but you don't necessarily, you can disagree with that. Um, but like to to sum up our very being in terms of we promote homosexuality, it, it's just simply wrong. And in some ways, the West is going to be tested. Like if all we are are gay pride parades, then we actually can lose a go global conflict. But the question is, can something be transformed? Can something change when the si the whole world situation changes? Can values actually shift when something as dramatic as what we are seeing is taking place? Also, 1,600 viewers live across three platforms. Odyssey, Cozy, the YouTube Mirror. It'll also be up on podcast at some point be tomorrow. right back. Keep yeah, talking. I'm just, I need to, my AirPods ran out of power. That's fine. One sec. That's fine. Go ahead. Uh, we'll talk for a second uh, and talk about those Richard men. They always they always turn out uh, every single time for for Mister Spencer, no matter what. Uh, now, are you ready? Do you have your yeah. queries? All right. Well, it's kind of changed a little bit. His his take was a little more reasonable than I was expecting. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get you in just a second because there's a couple more of these. Uh, let's see. All right. The I God Emperor right sent five dollars. Spencer supporting Globa Homo for the good of the white race. Buck broken. All right now. Leon sent ten dollars. Dear Mister Spencer, please retire from politics, please. You can $10. only hurt us. You can't help in any way. You must know this. Please consider. Thank you for your time. What do you say to that? And also the one before you could respond to as well. And then I'll let Cisco get in, and we'll take some calls and all that stuff. Oh, I see. I'll get these last two in. Go ahead, real quick. You want to respond to that? Uh, I can only hurt you guys. Maybe I want to hurt you guys. I mean, I, I don't know what to say. I don't. I do me. I, I don't do you. I'm not trying to help 
whoever said that comment. Like, I'm not here to help you. I'm here to pursue what I think is principled and important and serious. And I'm not on your team. I don't think you guys are ever been on my team. I don't know if I've ever been on your team. So what's the big deal? All right. Now let's see. Uh... A non underscore boy sent $3. Sorry, Spencer. That is literally what we are now. All right. Now. Oh, I Yehuda need to start Finkelstein sent $10. Damn. Richard. Is it true that the just for men hair dye you use has addled your brain and turned you into a wokatard? No. <laughs> What's up? How does this go with the just for men though? I don't, I'm not sure. All right. I like it. <laughs> I've, I've never been accused of dyeing my hair before, but this had, is a first. I hadn't heard that one. All right, now uh, we'll start up entry because I forgot. Cisco, go ahead while I figure that out and I'll get that going if people want to use it. <laughs> Well, how's it going, Richard? Good to meet you. Good to see um, you. Now, a lot of us on the right, of course, we kind of view the EU and NATO as, as kind of a vehicle for globalism with the kind of progressive as a vehicle for global progressive values. Um, and that includes things like multiculturalism. And I think even Eric Stryker the other day <clears throat> made a post about explaining to what life is like as a white person here in our multicultural society to the Azov Battalion and, and, and these type of people, um, ultra-nationalists in Ukraine, um, basically implicating that, hey, you're, you're working against your own interest here. Um, you think Russians are bad, wait until your country is filled with uh, African migrants type thing. Um, and, and it seems like this is, you know, we look at NATO and the conflict as, as kind of that, the progressive value vehicle for progressive values and multiculturalism versus this apparent right wing reactionary worldview that Russia has. Um, maybe that's exaggerated. I'm, I'm sure. Um, but there seems to be a, a kind of a traditional ethic and worldview that they have. Most of us here oppose the progressive regime here at home. So why would, why would we support that agenda over this apparent reactionary force? Does Eric Stryker want Russia to conquer America, kind of like a reverse Red Dawn, where he would, uh, they would come in and install, you know, GFs for everyone and make everyone Orthodox <laughs> Christian? Or what, what does he have in mind by this? Well, I, I, just, I, I, I want to still don't understand. Be Orthodox he wants, Christian, or he, but... he's a vicarious Russian nationalist. He wants to save, you know, pr, you know, you know, keep uh, traditionalism going in another country or something. I mean, I, I don't. I don't even know what to say to something like that. Um, I think that is based in large part upon a, a fantasy. Um, uh, in terms, this is not entirely Russia's fault. I would say this beforehand, but in terms of just some rates of alcoholism, rates of abortion, rates of familial dysfunction, rates of social dysfunction, these are, are very high and in birth rates were very low. Now things have evened out. And birth rates in Russia and France and Germany are, are roughly similar. Though I have heard some criticism about that uh, in terms of the you know ethnic con you know uh, uh, ethnic uh, makeup of of Greater Russia. Uh, but Greater Russia is not just some wheat field country. I mean, I've traveled throughout Russia. Um, Moscow is by no means this just purely white city. There's actually a tremendous Central Asian um, element there. So, I mean, th this is just, you know, kind of based on fantasy. What, what the question I would add is like, what has the Soviet Union desired for the West? And what has what, what is Putin desire for the West? We actually know this because we have information on this. Um, Putin himself was stationed in Dresden for throughout the 80s and um, maybe even up, up, up to the early, or very early 90s. Um, what did they promote in West Germany? They promoted crazed, um, violent terrorist organizations like the Red Army Faction. Um, I don't know. Maybe Eric Stryker kind of likes that, you know, crazed, anti-bourgeois communist uh, type of activity, but it was meant to generate chaos in the West. Um, more recently, Putin has kind of done some propaganda uh, to try to appeal to the right. 
Uh, he did that with January 6th, kind of, you know, saying, oh, we're monitoring the political prisoners and Russian television. There's a lot of talk about how, you know, there's no free speech in the West and everyone's thrown into prison. Just look at these people. Maybe there's some kernels of truth to no free speech, but uh, you could say equally say the same thing in Russia. Um, he wants the worst and he promotes things like the the far right or even promoting something like Trump, not that he's going to get some, you know, big geopolitical grab from it. He did get some things from Trump in early 2016 when Manafort was working for him. But it's just basically about giving people black eyes, you know, dumping Hunter Biden's laptop on the world and just spreading chaos and, and nonsense. And I don't want any of that. It doesn't actually lead anywhere. And the, the notion that Russia is a traditionalist society is just a kind of absurd. Um, it is a impoverished society due to their economic system. And when you get to the heart of the matter in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg, it's basically the West. Um, I mean, I, I don't, you know, they're, they actually are going to be really pissed by these sanctions, not, not just the inflation of the ruble, but the fact that they can't buy Gucci handbags. I mean, that, that's going to seriously maybe even threaten Putin's legitimacy among those people. Um, all of this is just fantasy. And uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just kind of tired of it. I mean, the, the West in general has gone down a, we, we are in a downward spiral. And we have nihilism at the very heart of what we are doing. And you can see this crop up in America. You can see it in Western Europe. You can see it in Russia. And we have to confront that. My small hope is that a kind of hot conflict like this, a cold war where, where there's an intensity and death is in the air, is actually going to inspire some inner reflection and a kind of a new identity crisis. Now, I might be wrong about that. But um, that's what we have to do, not not just jump on like vicarious bandwagons like Russia's great or Venezuela's based or all of this nonsense. Venezuela is not based. I'll say that for the record. No, in my opinion, no, I won't get on that train. Uh, go ahead, Cisco, follow up, and then we're going to get the calls in. I'll, I'll pick up the pace here a little bit uh, on my end. Sorry I'm about my pacing here. Go ahead. Sure, sure. Full disclaimer, I am, I am Orthodox Christian. I'm, I'm a member of the Russian Orthodox <laughs> Church. And, and so from our, like, I don't think any of us, at least myself or anyone who has ties to Russia and we are friends there, church connections or whatever, are under any illusion that Russia is this kind of perfect, you know, trad Christian Orthodox workplace. But when we look historically, we, we kind of do see a character change. You know, we, we do hearken back to the pre-Bolshevik revolution and we, we, we ourselves suffered greatly during the Soviet Union um, with the persecution of our church. And then in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, we, we see a reemergence of orthodoxy uh, kind of taking a, uh, kind of guiding the direction, at least culturally again of Russia. And so we will not, we acknowledge, I even like, I wrote a piece for Gab News that published yesterday I acknowledge in that, hey, you know, abortion's still a thing, Premar attitudes on premarital sex and all of these quote-unquote, you know, um, degenerate stuff is still a problem there, but it's trending in the in a, the opposite direction that, like, the what, what we have here, which, which you've kind of mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just well, see I, a real, a real the 90s. transformation. No question. I mean, but the 90s was a disaster. And in many ways, the U.S. Sure. created that disaster um, with the, the shock therapy and, and so on. There, and and there, there, it, there, it could have been done better. I mean, no, no question. Um, but I mean, look, on, on those kinds of measurements like abortion and teen pregnancy, these are going down in the West as well. Um, I mean, I, I think there's just a deeper nihilism. I, I was thinking about this. I don't know if I want to do a little thread on this, but it's it's like there is a very famous TV commercial um, in the mid '90s with Gorbachev, where he was in a Pizza Hut. It wasn't quite a McDonald's. That would have been more perfect, but it was a Pizza Hut. So he he agreed to participate this. in a yeah. Pizza Hut ad. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> 
And you have the older generation in this uh, table argument with the younger generation and um, about the usual stuff. And uh, then Gorbachev walks in and, and both generations are like, Ooh, this is a great guy, you know? And, um, and then they, but then they all agree that pizza tastes good. <laughs> So it's like, the, you know, this brings us together. And, you know, there was something kind of like homey and almost kind of trad, you know, it was family life, you know, about that. But it, it you could also view it from a Fukuyama's lens is like, this is the just pure end of history. Like Pizza Hut has annihilated communism. It's even like fed social strife with pizza shoved pizza down its mouth and it, you know you could kind of see that as this just utter nihilism of uh, uh, of the american way of life um one thing i've noticed now mcdonald's has uh, apparently shut down in, in russia that was its 30 years end of an era you know it's like mcdonald's conquered Marx, yeah. and now some of these uh, Russian pizza chains that have the word Mac in them are making a comeback. So we're all like, you know, now you, you don't have the evil capitalist American McDonald's. You now have, you know, Mac, you know, <laughs> Dona Mac or whatever, just some uh, like Russian version of exactly the same form of cultural nihilism. All right, let me get some callers in here. Uh, Shia, go ahead. Now, let's be a little, I won't say respectful, but get, you know what I mean? Let's not get too crazy where we can't understand what you mean. Go ahead. Uh, not saying you in particular. I'm just saying that at the start of the calls. Let's, now go ahead. Uh, yeah, I actually, I actually have kind of like a nice, polite question and everything. Okay. okay. So, uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, when you're talking about the Traders Coalition, like, who are we betraying? Is it the American state or the American people? Because they're not the same thing, you know? Um, yeah, you're, you're betraying both because the American people can, will only exist if there is some kind of state to protect them. And you are attack, you're not attacking feminism by siding with another country. You're basically atta attacking the thing about the United States government that is there to protect you. So mm -hmm. I, I, the other thing about the traders, I mean, I, I agree, it's outrageous language in some ways. I, I have a tendency to do that. Uh, but it's, it's basically showing that it's, it's a, there's a resentment at the heart of this. It's like, you know, lo and behold, you know, surprise, surprise, we have this coalition of people who just basically hate everything and buy into every single conspiracy theory that comes down the pike. And they're all now pro Putin. Like what a shock. It's just purely based on resentment and fantasy thinking. Now, um, your guest what was his name Cisco is yeah Michael Cisco yeah he's yeah, yeah he's yeah. obviously much more nuanced and in his uh, uh, you know wh whatever my disagreements might be he's, he's attempting to recapture a tradition and I have respect for that all right now go ahead Shia. well <clears throat> you have to admit Putin's a hell of a lot cooler than Joe Biden <laughs> <laughs> well I think I mean you do have real to, here do you have to admit that Richard no, um, I mean, wait. look, there, there's some photo ops, oh. shirtless bear riding. Okay. You know, fantastic. That that's all, that's all just nonsense. I mean, I, I if, if Putin were in the West and he had a, he owned a hundred million dollar yacht, I think you might have a very different impression of him. He's playing he's pretty cool. Though. Come on. You got to say though. He's, he, he doesn't, he comes have off. You ever cool. seen Joe Biden eat ice cream? I will ask <laughs> one more time. Have you ever seen Joe Biden uh, eat ice cream? I've seen, I've seen him doddering that, off the stage. That too. is cool. I was it's told that you got to watch. Uh, you got to watch Putin do the five minute walk. You got to watch that video with Putin. Walking That's right. For five with the minutes, wide man. frame. All right. He's way too cool. Thank you. Shy. I appreciate you calling him, man. I do have a very important question for Richard. All right, go ahead. What what is your favorite kind of burger, Richard? Oh no, we do. Mm -hmm. We already know that. Swiss one. with uh, Swiss. caramelized onions <laughs> yeah. and mushrooms. You can find it in many different establishments. Uh, Chipper Jones, but it's not really Chipper Jones. Hello, Dingo. How's it going? Hey, what's up? Uh oh, what's up, man? How's it going? You cut out for a sec, but you're back. Okay, sorry. Well, I I would I had a off topic question. Uh, if that's cool. Uh, well, the, yeah, I mean, it depends on what it is, I guess. But 
<laughs> Go ahead, Jack. <laughs> All right, well, Richard, uh, and this, this, I swear to God, this is not like a, a backhanded compliment or a dig on my life. I just have to draw a comparison. Last last couple of times you were here, you looked really like worn out, tired, possibly like maybe you've been drinking too much. I don't know, but you just, you looked rough. Today, you look like you've lost weight. It looks like your teeth are extra white. Your hair is fixed all nice. What, um, what changed in your life, man? And the genuine, just curious, like what changed in your life? You seem a lot more cleaned up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, when was I on here last? Mm, I don't know. I'd have to check the, I don't know. the list. But. I got a new webcam. <laughs> uh, maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah, I've, I've been uh, doing a lot of working out. No, in terms of the uh, alcohol consumption, uh, actually over the past uh, couple of years, I've really uh, um, cut back quite a bit and uh, you, feel, you feel better that way and you kind of enjoy a good drink more in that sense. So, uh, no, I'm trying to stay healthy and I go to the gym a lot and, um, yeah, there's some good personal things happening in my life and to seeing, you know, kids really bring out the best in me, although they can, they can be uh, frustrating as hell, but, um, yeah, but I appreciate the comments. Hey, no problem. Yeah. You got, you get, well, never mind. I'm not going to ask how many kids you got, but, um, I got, I got young kids too, dude. And, uh, I, I was noticing the day that my, my son, my oldest son, too big for me to like put him to bed and carry him to bed anymore. And it's really, really sad because hmm. it's like they'll never be that small again. You know, what, however, however small they are today, they'll never be that young again. That sucks. True. All That's right. true. That's true. Dinger. What else you got, brother? Uh, yeah, no, nothing. That's all. I just wondered what happened. Okay. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you calling in. Uh, basement wizard, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for bringing me on, Ralph. Uh, You're welcome. Richard, I kind of wanted to ask you about um, how you see the divide between Russia and the West, because uh, you do seem to lament Russia not seeing itself as part of quote, you, the greater white race. Yes. Uh, and so this kind of attaches to a problem I've had with a lot of people on the right which is they sort of they have this idea of the broader white race but that centers a sort of anglo-saxon tradition uh, so when you're talking about maybe greeks or italians or russians or whatever it's like look you're part of us but you're like the fringe of us but like we definitely want you to be part of us and i guess my question to you is like how is that a good sales pitch to russia like why should russia not say no we're going to have Russia as the center, our identity as the center. And if you want to be part of our thing, you can be the fringe of us. <laughs> well, they certainly have the right to, to say that. And I, I think some of them might kind of think like that. I, I think it's a slightly different. I mean, I, I think it's a defining of us and them with vis-a-vis -vis the West. And so we, in a way, can't be a part of them. Not that there isn't a kind of assimilationist tradition of, of some kind, but, um, I, I, I don't think that they they think in the way that I do. But, I mean, again, there are examples of I mean, whether these could go anywhere or not, who knows. But, like, there, there, there were at least people talking about it, motions towards bringing Russia into NATO. And I, and I would uh, agree with that. I mean, at the end of the day, I am Anglo-Saxon and Saxon. So I have... Um, uh, Central German blood, and and I have English blood. If and I may cut in quickly, this is who so I, I am, you... you know, I mean, of course, I think, like I do, of course, I think people like me are the best. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I wouldn't expect anyone not to. It just strikes me as sort of, it's often arrogant when dealing with people where they they sort of attack you for not putting the idea, the concept of whiteness above your ethnicity. In my case, I'm Greek and the case mm -hmm. of this conflict russians um but then they want you to accept that the terms of that identity they want you to embrace is centered on them and not you right and it seems it seems kind of arrogant so i guess my question to you would be like how do you differentiate your conception of the greater white race to the traditional sort of anglo-saxon biases about the rest of europe well what is it it's all nogs past calais i mean that that that's a a very bigoted um, Anglo-Saxon bias. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I no, I don't. I don't. I certainly don't think like that. Um, 
Uh, what was the question? Like how I differentiate it from like, yeah, I mean, there, there is a kind of Anglo-Saxon bias where basically the whole world is shit and everything and everything outside of London doesn't matter. So, I mean, I, I, I absolutely want to embrace a kind of cosmopolitanism beyond that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess, I guess I've thought like this for a long time. I mean, I read Nietzsche's beyond good and evil when I was very young and uh, I mean, in my early twenties, um, but it's been a long time since I first encountered those ideas, but I think I always had notions like this, even when I was a, a teenager and so on. But I mean, in the 1880s, Nietzsche was recognizing that Europe was coming together and that there is a kind of European type that is emerging. And he was talking about this in the age of the telegraph and train travel and so on. And, um, and in some ways we're united through our kind of collective struggle with Christianity and nihilism, et cetera. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think today, you know, more than ever, I mean, there, there are obvious differences between someone who's Italian and someone who's Norwegian. I mean, we get it. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem like our commonality is greater and we all in our kind of struggle. Yeah, is so greater. I guess what I'm asking is, can you define that? Like, what is that commonality? Cause typically when you ask people, it's like, well, my Anglo-Saxon norms and view of history is the commonality. You so what, what do you see as the commonality that would bind London to Paris, to Berlin, to Moscow? You know, it's interesting. I have a article, um, called, uh, uh, politics in the grand style. And it's a, you know, analysis of Nietzsche. It's my own thing as well, but it, it, it actually looked at this in the sense of like our history of living through Christianity and struggling with nihilism in a way binds us all. And so it's a kind of negative identity in that sense um, I, I do sense, I so, do think that there are, but that, that is, very, that is, a, that is like a Germanic angle. A rapid caller, by the way, you're, you're getting Nietzsche, loyal. Nietzscheanism binds us. I mean, not it, really. No, our struggle with nihilism. It's a, it's a kind of Nietzschean take on it. Not Nietzscheanism binds us. I mean, I would love for that to be the case. All right, caller, get your last point in. Cause I got to take more okay, calls. You're getting I guess my, my last point would be, you mentioned you read Nietzsche when you were really young. One of the first books I read when I was about 14, 15 was crime and punishment. Uh, and that had a big influence on me. So, you know, if your commonality is going to be like our struggle with nihilism, I mean, I just don't think that's an effective sale to an effective sell to a significant part of Europe. And I would ask you to come back with like a maybe yeah, past Nietzscheism. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what to say, but I don't think nihilism is the defining characteristic of the West. But I always appreciate hearing from you, Spencer. Um, you're kind of oh, like yeah, Zizek. I like you, hearing you your are, critiques, you, you, but I don't you're believe what you say. Very anyway, thank you very much. Question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, we have people in uh, Chaggett. Jason Kessler is in the green room as well. I don't even know what's going on. Chaggett, oh, I do know what's going on with you. Uh, what's what's up? Chaggett, man, fuck. I gave you that big wind-up. I know you're a big Richard fan, actually. <laughs> Uh, because I've heard you talk about it before to me personally, uh, but we can't hear you. This might be a Discord issue. Um, I don't think Kessler's is going to work any better, but I'll try him in a minute too. Omega King, go ahead real quick. Let me see if you're – okay, your Discord works. Okay, let's get yours in real quick. Um, all right, first, I want to say that, yeah, I, I, I agree that Richard Spencer looks better today. He's got those rosy cheeks. The baby soft skin and the the pretty blue eyes, but um, what? I do disagree with him on Russia. I think that uh, the West has gotten so bad and it keeps getting worse. It keeps getting more hostile to white people, and a lot of white people have been brainwashed into like being against their own race and like wanting to import thousands of blacks who are then going to vote into the in the elections and take over our governments with like, like thousands of Obamas. And uh, I think Russia doesn't have that problem to the same extent. And I think that they say stuff that's like, 
Like that's more in line with like what the the, the West is saying. Like, oh, we're gonna denazify Ukraine. Uh, we don't see race. Blah blah blah. But I think they don't really think that deep down inside. I think if you look, you you can actually look at some of the stuff Putin said that he's like against the globalism and stuff like that. I think they do are are sort of reactionary towards the what the West has become because I don't think Western values are in line with like what Richard Spencer believes deep down in his heart. I think Western values has, has become something very sinister and disgusting right. and anti-white and like this, this clergy plan type of thing where everyone's going to mix together and be like a mulatto race or something like that. And I don't agree with that. And I think fighting back against that is just going to get progressively harder. So, you know, but I think that, since Russia doesn't have democracy, it doesn't have like this whole idea of feminism and stuff like that. They're a little bit more resilient to that, like ent- entropy, like degeneration towards. All right, that. caller. So, okay. Thank you, sir. We'll I appreciate you calling. Rick, can I can I hear what Richard Spencer has to say? Uh, you can, but I'm you, gonna. You did. I mean, move to Russia. Then I I don't know. I, I don't know what to say. Well, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 this, that doesn't answer what I said. Like, it doesn't answer. Why, why would you, why would you agree with you? The West that, in this way, the West has gone mad. My, my, I, I think there's a lot of wishful thinking going on about what's going on in Russia, but beyond that. It's like, what is going to change it? Maybe this new world paradigm actually offers a chance for that to change as opposed to just sinking further, continuing where we've been going. And that's just a little bit of a hope that I have. I, I, I think it's more than a hope because look, if, if we are talking about the threat of nuclear war, you just almost inherently have to become more like based in this word, you, you, you have to be able to fight back and the intensity makes you think more clearly. So, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what to say. If, if someone just wants to say like the West sucks, it's kind of like, well, I kind of agree, but hey, well, you know, uh, what right. can change that is the question. Now caller, thank you. I hate to cut you off, but we, well, there's no way I'm going to get everybody on if, if I don't. All right, Kessler, you're muted though. You, you'll have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Is the thing so? Um, I noticed you were muted in the in the call, which you don't need to do because okay. Well, let's see. Oh, there you go. No, no, you're back. You're you're there now. Now let's keep it respectful. Uh, as I mentioned, if we if we could. Uh, all right, I've got a series of questions. All right. Actually, I've got more than just one question. Okay. Well, okay. go ahead. All right. Can you guys hear me? Am I live now? Uh, yeah, you're on the air. All right. Fantastic. This is the first time that I've spoken to uh, Richard since the uh, we were in a courtroom together. And uh, as somebody who had the misfortune of knowing uh, Spencer during his brief heyday, I know a very different Richard Spencer than the one that he's presenting himself as right now. When I knew Spencer in, say, May 2017, he was very awkwardly leading people in a chant of uh, Russia is our friend in front of international media cameras. He was forcing people to do that, really. I mean, no one else was trying to chant that. So, Richard, how do you go from chanting uh, Russia is our friend to going 180 degrees to this libtard signaling with Ukraine flags in your profile? I don't know, Jason. I don't know, Jason. Answer the question. You're the smart guy. You think you're a smart guy. I guess you're not making enough being a smart no. guy to even afford an attorney, but uh, just give it a shot. Jason, I, I just have no interest in talking with you. Yeah. Uh, so a no. lot of people are speculating that has to do with the fact that you were married to an ultra. Uh, uh, now, wait, wait, now we're not going to go into the person. I don't, because I, you know, I want I just don't want to go there. I, I know some people. I mean, want. he himself has said that his positions. On well, Russia if you want to keep it to the, just, if, you'll get a life. I mean, just focus on something else. I mean, if, I if you want to keep it to the policy and you don't I'm, offer anything, you don't offer. So anything to you used person. to say that Russia was the sole white power in the world. Didn't you say that? All right, now I'm 
obviously it's not entirely he, wrong. I mean, well, well, I was going to ask, but see, I, I think what he's saying there is okay to talk about. Um, what what do you? We kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, actually. Um, how how your views have shifted, um, you know, on Russia, uh, but you could follow back up on that if you want. Well, I mean, it's not entirely wrong to say that Russia is the preeminent white power in the world. I mean, we we have a you know largely white country. We have a kind of you know badass white leader in Putin who has thousands of nuclear weapons. So it it is he he is a, of a different order than Sweden or any other country like that. So he has to be considered in the world. Um, in terms of Russia as our friend, I, I've, yeah, I mean, those were chance. The idea that I forced people to do that or something is uh, just this insanity that Jason believes in. Um, but, you know, I would endorse that view. I have nothing, I have nothing but affection and the best wishes towards Russia. Uh, I wouldn't say that about Putin. I, I think I have changed my mind about Putin. I, I think I, bought into the hype to a very large degree and um the you know the photos of him you know shirtless hunting (laughs) antelope or whatever it's easy to kind of think oh this guy must be a badass um i think he's i see him now he is a badass in some ways i think i see him now as more of a, a gangster type person and that's not i don't again he does not have my vision he certainly does not wish the best for uh where I am living and people in the world. And um, I I just have a very, a a much darker view of him. Um, I I think all of the stuff that, I mean, Russia gate is not entirely um, false. And uh, God, these AirPods keep running out of power. I keep trying to frantic. Hold on a second. I think it's just totally inauthentic for you to have gone 180 degrees like this. And a lot of people speculate that you might be working for different, um, Alphabet uh-huh. agency. Yeah, well, I mean, and I just, I just want to. All right, I'll let you get it in you. now. Wait, hold on, hold on, wait, so wait, stupid. wait, wait, hold I mean, on. I just, I'm gonna let you get in your final no point. And we to hear from you, Jason. Well, we only have a certain amount of time, and I didn't set it up a full blood sports or anything. So I don't want to let it. I know I'll let you go in. And, you know, argue with Beardson for like 30, 45 minutes. I'll let you get in your 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 last question, final point here. I'll let Richard respond. We'll move on to the rest because I'm only gonna keep him to the bottom of the hour because I told him I promised him we wouldn't do. All right, three I have hours. a number. I promised him in private we wouldn't do another three-hour session well i know you may have three questions but you're not getting three in is what i'm telling you now but you will get one of those three in so go ahead and ask that one is, is what I'm okay two can i have two you can have the maybe if you're crafty enough but you better just slip them in at one go here right, All right. like this is your so, last speaking uh, opportunity the question is about changing of financing i'm not talking about the government the russian government but have you ever taken any money from any russian sources prior to your recent conversion not now not that I know of, no. Right. So, is this? not even when you invited Dugan to be uh, a speaker at your conference in Hungary, when you had an ultra national Russian nationalist wife, you never took a dime from Russia. All right, now get in your second right. question. He just said that he answered the first one. All yeah. right, when you were in Moscow, did you uh, ever visit David Duke's apartment in Moscow? No. Well, I didn't, I didn't know, know he, he had, had one. one. I was about to say, what the fuck? I didn't know he had one in Moscow. <laughs> Holy shit, that's kind of baller. Yeah, I was reading and doing my research. <laughs> I've got a lot of research questions that Damn. I guess I won't have time to ask. Well, you did get well, two out of your three in, so it wasn't too bad. Thank you for calling in, sir. I do appreciate it. All right. All right, now, okay. Uh, righteous, go ahead. Research questions. Okay, well, you still got the radio on. Uh, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Good evening, gentlemen. Yes, Richard, evening. so I mean, uh, I obviously don't think you should be attacked. You're clearly an intelligent guy and you have valid points that you're making. Um, but I just did, don't believe you're being pragmatic about this entire situation. I mean, clearly there's a million variables at play. Putin could be clearly playing us. Um, we could destroy each other like a Byzantium type, Persia type situation where we just get swept over by a, the Chinese or whoever. And there could be a million bad ac- outcomes, but I don't see the point in us really sitting on our hands and allowing ourselves to get further in the hole of not being able to climb back out of this Zog degeneracy, this Zog situation that we've been in. And we, we, we're so desperate for a way out of it that you can't fail to recognize why people would 
grasp at something such as Putin fighting back against Zog. No one wants to I be understand ruled over by the Russians. That, we just want a chance it to fight back on our own and somehow get Zog weakened in some way. I mean, well, does that has not that make happened? sense? Like, th- this is another thing of like, people were saying, oh, uh, you know, America's been embarrassed and it, it humiliated NATO is in the scrap heap. Has any of that happened? I mean, no, I, I don't believe so. For a, no, I, I, just to say this, I absolutely don't support this, but le- there was a poll of like 70% of the public wanted a no-fly zone over Ukraine. I mean, that, that does not sound like popular illegitimacy for NATO. There has been talk in Sweden, which was pushed down a little bit today, of Sweden joining, Estonia, Finland are talking about joining, Germany's rearming. I mean, the, the, the legitimacy of these things has increased due to Putin's uh, invasion. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's like the revival of all of these institutions has been accomplished by Putin. So he's oh, not really doing anything. I completely agree with that. Okay. But uh, what I'm saying is you must understand the desperation and also the fact that most people in our movement do not agree that the leaders represent the people. I also agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, look, we, I mean, if some, I have said this like three times, that we've gone mad. I mean, I don't know how yes. else to put it. There, there is just something, yeah, there is a insanity at the heart of the, the West just in de- from top to bottom. I mean, from like a lower school in North Dakota to Washington, D.C., you can find madness at every level. This is I mean, because I we're agree. not following an objective narrative. What? We're not following an objective narrative. Like we're getting all this misinformation everywhere. There's a lot of misinformation, but that's nothing new. I mean, war and misinformation go hand in hand. I, I think there's been, like, we see more of it because of social media. So it, there's like more quantity, but in terms of just total misinformation and rumors, and uh, that's absolutely nothing new in war. That is the norm. Yeah. So how can we believe the propaganda that is telling us that Putin is the aggressor, that we should well, I mean, do you want, I mean, just because there's a lot of fake news doesn't mean that this isn't real. I mean, do you think that Putin didn't invade Ukraine? No, he absolutely did, but I, I believe okay. he did. So he has he has his own agenda. We can't trust his sincerity in any regard. Okay. So so it comes down to what his actions are. His actions, in our view, is that he is taking a stand against Zog, which we see as our primary enemy. So he the is, friend, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Our aim is to denazify Ukraine. I don't believe that's his war aim. No, well, I know, but see, why do you believe it when the West says it, but then you don't believe? Whenever Putin says it, it's like, oh, he doesn't mean that. Maybe that's exactly what he means. And maybe I actually a lot trying of people to, in the West he's are trying lying. to use the um, buzzword of that works in the West. No, he's well, kind of, but I would say seventy five percent of it is a much deeper Russian thing about yeah. defining themselves, defining the the legitimacy of the Soviet state as defeating the Third Reich. You know, whatever you want to say about communism, at least we were the ones who beat the Nazis. And that is true. I mean, the, if the if there were only the British Empire and America, I mean, uh, who knows what would have happened? I mean, the, the Russians did the fighting and dying on the Eastern Front that truly pushed Germany back and defeated Germany. But at the same time, you can't endlessly define your legitimacy on the basis of we defeated Hitler. So I think the denazification thing was like a very deep, it, it goes back a long way. And I think he I meant it. All right, call our last little point, and uh, I'm going to play the Super Chats and then the last call. But what I'm saying basically, just to get to the crux of the situation, is what should we do if we're so tired of sitting on our hands and allowing ourselves to be trampled upon? We see an opportunity for Zog to be weakened through Putin, Putin pushing back against them. Could we be being played? Yes, absolutely. We could be, be. This could be the worst catastrophe for our entire movement, but at least it's something 
happening. We're so tired of inaction. We're so tired of the same indifference. The nihilism you're still you talk sitting about. on your hands. You're, you're watching you. Russia invade Ukraine and thinking that he's really attacking, you know, Jen Psaki or the feminist at UC Berkeley or something. He's not. No, and but it exposes anything, their hypocrisy. Targeting these institutions. All right, caller. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. Uh, all right, now let's see here. Uh, Excuse me. No, it's okay. Let's kind of working off this cough. I've, I've had a cough for like two weeks. Yeah, I know how it lingers a little bit right up in here. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't think I have had COVID. I was about to say I didn't say. Underscore boy sent three dollars. Nothing has significantly changed in the global order. Stop gaslighting people into thinking something has really changed. What do you say about that? That's absurd. I mean, things have kind of, yeah, I would be hard to, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. Dynamics have changed. <laughs> I think it'd be hard to the, say the anything. Sanctions are so big that they're not even sanctions at this point. They are just a bifurcation of the world. And there's a real chance of like Russia turns east, they start delivering all that gas and oil and so on to China. We now have like the Chimerica arrangement, you know, your iPhone basically like, is this going to last? Like, we don't know. I mean, it's so much has changed. It's, it's utterly dramatic. I mean, there's some, uh, yeah, a famous quote of, you know, sometimes for decades, nothing will happen. And then in a few minutes, everything will happen. I mean, I, I think that's what we've seen over the past two weeks. I know uh, it's, Oh, go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. I, I mean, I've heard some people criticize our our actions from like the West and the NATO as kind of pushing Russia into China's arms, and that being a yeah. very bad thing. When we could yeah. when we could have had an, a partnership with them that may have been beneficial to us. What are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with that. Yeah, Mersheimer said a lot of that. I totally agree. Uh, but the question is, what does what does what do the Russians want? Like, it's easy to, you know, to be in your armchair at the University of Chicago and be like, ah, you know, the world power is shifting to, towards the east, towards Asia. So we should link up with Russia and then we can kind of like, you know, confront them better. I mean, again, I agree with that. But the question is, is that how Putin thinks? Is that what he wants? It's not, you know, people aren't totally constrained by power dynamics. On some level, there's like a, a, a veer two quality to geopolitics and a, and a historical and spiritual quality, if you want to use that. And I think Putin has a design. He has an image of a world order and of a Russian zone. And I don't think even if Mersheimer and myself agreed with the notion that you should be supplying gas to Germany and not to, to Asia, whether he would agree with that is the question, whether he would want to be a part of that deal. And I don't think he does. All right. Now let's see. All right. Where am I at here? Okay. Uh, there we go. Markov sent $3. Spencer voted Biden, took the vax and it now pro Ukraine. Sussy faggot. All right. <laughs> Anonymous Fast. sent three dollars. Dick shaped his entire current worldview around spitefulness against Nick and the Groypers. Rent free. Did you do that? No. All right. No. Black Phillips sent three dollars. Dick, what do you think of Azov Battalion being allowed to exist with a Jewish president? Like they are openly Nat socks, or at least some of them. <laughs> Why wouldn't a Jew fold them into the regular army? And well, he how did. Azov is asking for nationalist volunteers. Yeah, he did, but they're still allowed to be Nazis, though. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in some <laughs> ways it's kind of like Isn't that you crazy. Know, Clarice Starling had to go visit Hannibal Lecter or something. It's you know, it's like they're Nazis, but there are Nazis. I mean, I think <laughs> he's literally what it's like. Yeah, yeah. he kind of recognized that there's there's an intensity that he needs in this situation and. They it can be dealt with later. Um, <laughs> it's crazy though. I mean, like uh, it's crazy. But have you noticed also the nuance in the in the liberal media about Nazis? Oh yeah, like, now they're all about. Them. Well, yeah. on the one hand, you know, like, like they never would. On the one hand, 
when it came to like the alt right years ago or something. It's just like they're evil. Ah. We listened you know, to a five minute NPR uh, segment about right. this. The now they're like, like oh, it's well, a complicated, nuanced yeah. discussion that we have to have yeah. about these. Like, Don't overreact. Yeah, exactly. Before it was punch a Nazi, uh, <laughs> right. right? Kill them, right? Basically, I mean, you'd see that type of stuff. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, fuck. Oh, God sent $3 to totally unrelated questions. How tall are you? Always wanted to know and not necessarily TRS or NJP, but specifically, what do you think of Warren Balog? How tall am I? Is that the question? That was the first one, yeah. I'm 6'1". And then Warren Balog, who I've heard of. Uh, I yeah, I mean, I, I've, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't really, I, I've met him a few times. He was a, a very nice guy. Um. I, I've I've seen some posts on Telegram that I find a bit disturbing, but um, what's your Telegram? Him, by the way, I was looking for that. I thought, I, what is your Telegram? I have a t- kind of a Telegram. It just reproduces my uh, oh your Twitter tweets. Feed. Okay, okay, I yeah, know. okay. Uh, I I I'll use Telegram occasionally just to kind of look at things. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I have another. Yeah, it, it's up there. Um, yeah, I mean, he he was a very nice guy when I met him, so I don't I don't have any uh, any issue or something. I mean, I I don't know what to say. Okay. Uh... Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson Jr. sent five dollars. Richard Shalom, Russian Chief Rabbi Beryl Lazar and Ukrainian Chief Rabbi Yaakov Dov Blyk and Chief Rabbi Moshe Asman of Kiev would like to extend an olive branch. You have shown to be the most useful Shabbos goy in our world to come. Please consider. Anonymous sent $3 people are willing to admit that wokeism is due to decadence, but can't see how conflict can help reverse it. I think this conflict, no matter its outcome, is a net good for the West. The universe likes equilibrium, conflict is leads to change. What do you say that scene? Boom. I saw your face light up there. <laughs> I've, I've reached someone, or maybe they came up with those ideas on their own, but I'll take it. All right, now, uh, here we go. Okay. Anonymous sent $3 question for Mr. Spendler. What do you plan on doing now that your career in politics is over? Can you get a regular job in this cancel culture environment? I'm just doing me. I mean, I, um, I do work on a lot of publishing uh, endeavors. I'll go on stuff like this. I've got a regular podcast. I mean, it, it's, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of back where I was before 2017 or whatever. I, I don't know what to say. All right, now let's see. Basement Wizard no. sent $3. Thanks for letting me get a long call in, Ralph. Maybe I went on a little long and annoyed you. No. Here's some money to smooth that over. <laughs> Thank you. you yeah, that does help. Uh, but no, you didn't annoy me. I'm just trying to keep it a little tighter than normal. Uh, and I'm still Dylan V sent $3. Was here. that the real Jason Kessler attacking him just now? It was, yeah. That's pretty fucked up since I've personally heard Richard defending him on podcasts and never heard him attacking him. I don't know the whole history there. but uh, uh, I, I think the whole... Um, I mean, look, J- Jason is, is Jason, but it's um, the the jumping, the, the 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 demonization of Charlottesville. I mean, obviously, like a lot, there there were some really poor de- there were some poor decisions that went into it. Obviously, a ton of things went wrong, and obviously, the entire media was you know out to get us and so on. So, but like this demonization of Charlottesville as you know, we would have won or something if not for Charlottesville is just absurd. And there were a, you know, a a lot of good people who went there. A lot, some, there were a lot of bad people too. Um, It's just, it just is what it is. It, it, I just think it has to be looked at fairly and objectively. And so you know, I, I think one of the worst things that came out of 2018, I guess, or 20 late 2017 was just this like, um, oh, the Charlottesville and the Wignats and what it was just all just massively divisive and stupid all in the real rear view mirror at this point. All right. Now, let's see. <clears throat> OK. Anonymous sent three dollars. Richard is our favorite theater kid turned undercover agent. We always admire your effort and commitment to your craft. We can tell you enjoy your job. The way they had you be your own lawyer was a humorous touch. Uh, 
No. They had me be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now let me read these real quick. I um, don't regret doing that, by the way. Now we could talk about that. Well, we don't have time now. No. Uh, Yehuda Finkelstein says, Richard, what the hell is your definition of traitor on the Ukraine question? Is your definition people like Nick Fuentes who are loudly pro Putin? Or do you think people who oppose American and NATO intervention and the resulting high energy prices and economic pain are also traitors? No, I, I understand that. I also understand rational criticism. What I'm getting at is this kind of traitor mentality that is basing a view on resentment and siding with anything that is going, that is seeking to destroy your lived world, your basic existence and your country and doing it out of some kind of resentment or misplaced wishful thinking. I do think that is the mentality of a traitor. Yehuda Finkelstein says, Richard, how do you realistically see anything positive coming out of American leadership in NATO and on the Ukraine question? I've already talked about yeah, that. Okay. Base Norman says, would you have been pro-Russia in 2015? Well. I was. Yeah, so was, yeah that's it. <laughs> Brendan Gomez says, Emily Gersinski, Julia Ioff, or however you say her name, uh, Peter Dow, uh, and Richard Spencer, the new European Unity Coalition, leading the charge against the treasonous white malcontent shilling for a genocidal petrostate. Carl Breaker says Ukraine is less than 1% Muslim. Russia is 28% Muslim. Um, I would have to look at that. I believe it's 5% Chechen. It's it's uh, lower than some think. 28% Muslim. I'll have to go look at that. All right. Chagat, very lightning. I shouldn't even give you a chance, but very lightning. Oh, it's already 930. I know. That's why I'm trying to get you out of here. Chagat, go ahead. Oh, my God. <sighs> So I can't let the last caller be a, a silent caller. Chaggett, man, you bastard. Okay, let me try. Chaggett, hello. Hello. Okay, you know what? You on your phone. God bless. Oh, go ahead. You're the last caller. How do you feel about our Japanese allies if you're talking about uh, different levels of whiteness? What? Where do they, where do they fall into it? <laughs> uh that's out of honorary no Aryans or something like that. <laughs> there you go, I'm based. All right. <laughs> did you do your push-ups today? Uh, did you do your push? -ups? I didn't, uh, but uh, I don't know if Richard did. Richard looks like he's uh, like Dingo said earlier. He looks bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, as my grandpa used to say. What about your guest there in, in studio, do you do push-ups? Did you, Richard? I don't know. Fuck. I don't know. Well, I, I worked out today. Did upper body stuff today, so I did some decline presses. And some flies, some pull-ups, and some hammer curls. What else did I do today? Yeah, all that kind of stuff. So yes, some skull crushers. No, <laughs> no I was saying for you, for your for your guy in the studio there. Skull crushers. Oh, yeah. oh, Cisco, did you do your push-ups? I thought about it. <laughs> you went to church. You, you went to church, but you didn't do your push-ups for Jesus. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, thank you, Elb. Yeah, I wasn't have aware. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, y'all have a good one. I know you got to go, you know, everybody, you know, so, yeah. All right, Later. thank you. And I see Dalton calling in. Why didn't you call in earlier? Uh, because now it's like I have to I have to shut it down because uh, I told I told Richard that I would at 90 minutes. Uh, I appreciate you coming on, uh, yes. sir. To plug your stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're on Odyssey, so we're kind of back there. We're doing the podcast again. I was I was busy and uh, got some new books out, so you can just watch my Twitter feed. Just look at my Twitter feed, uh, Richard B. Spencer at SwissCheeseburger.com. <laughs> Very good, sir. It's always a fun show when you come on. We, uh, big uh, big viewer count all night. Everybody always has fun when you're here, good and bad, uh, and you never know what's going to happen uh, with your appearances, too. Uh, so thank you, man. Be safe, uh, stay healthy, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Talk to you later, Ralph. Later, man. Bye. All right. Uh, Richard Spencer, as he said, check out his Twitter account. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Lofa. Remember to like and subscribe.